And, um, but they did know this, that their uh, families made money off of selling these things to the, the uh, antiquities dealer in Jerusalem and in Bethlehem. So they took some of them. They took them back. The parents, of course, uh, didn't know how to read and write. The kids didn't know how to read and write. So they went to this guy's shop in Bethlehem, and he, he can tell they're old. He doesn't know what they are, but he buys them because he knows people just buy old stuff. So um, it goes on from there. And we have a number of individuals come together. But guess what? One of the first discoveries of the Dead Sea Scrolls ended up for sale in the Wall Street Journal. Shepherds, we talked about that. Here are the shepherds. We worked with, I worked with, um, that was a uh, grandfather to one of the guys we worked with uh, two summers ago, Joseph, and we'll see him in a little while. Tamira tribe, very respected, the, uh, f a few elders run the whole tribe. Bedouins peered into the cave through the opening and saw a strange shape in the darkness. The Bedouins lowered himself into the cave through the opening and found scores of scroll jars lying on the floor of the cave. They saw there was some type of arrangement. The Bedouins took the scrolls back to their tents for a couple of years until a relative suggested they sell them in Bethlehem. The exact cave, that was cave one, the first one they found. Kondo sold four scrolls to the Syrian Orthodox Metropolitan. But along comes this guy on the right, John Trevor. Trevor was an ancient Near Eastern studies scholar. He can tell, he doesn't know what they are, but he can tell this could be something really, really important. Most of the scrolls, they're not like this. Most of them are about like this high. And sometimes the scroll, when you unroll it, it's like 65 feet. We've covered those. Keep going. August 1952, cave four and five and six are discovered in the Maro Terrace opposite the site of Qumran. Bedouins sell the Jordanian uh, institution's 15,000 fragments from cave four for $15,000. Do you know what some of this stuff goes for now when they find it? Millions. Absolutely millions. So from 51 to 56, they continue to excavate and search for whatever's there, but especially scrolls. This was uh, the 1950s, the first big dig up there. Again, um, horrendous heat, eight months a year, so most of the stuff is being done either early morning or at night. 1953, archaeologists searched Cave 3 and found two halves of a copper scroll lying on a rock shelf cut into the cave wall. After years, the scroll was successfully unrolled by cutting it into sections. These sections are housed today uh, in Amman, Jordan, in the Citadel Museum. You have to remember at that time, at that time, um, the Jordanians were right uh, next to Israel, even in the old city. Once the copper scroll, called 3Q15, was read, it proved to be a treasure map. So what, what is this thing? When you first started reading it, and uh, it sounded like a treasure map. Go here, go there, up here, down there, measure this, all that kind of stuff. And so it listed 66 sites, and everybody is on a scroll rush. This is big. And guess what it is? It's all hoax. It was like a, it was like a, what, a lure to keep people away from looking at what was really important 
to trying to find something out there in the middle of nothing. Translation of 3Q15, discovery. Uh, the, the four means the cave, Q Qumran. 521 um, texts or fragments found there. Uh, in cave four, Bedouin found 15,000 scroll fragments and archeologists another 40,000 buried beneath cave four. So you see, this is what you usually see in the Bible dictionaries and atlases. The picture on the right, Qumran, that is cave four and it had a fake floor to it. So some of the stuff was found on the floor and something gave way and sure enough, it was uh, most of the stuff was down under the floor. But we were digging right across from that site um, about what, maybe from here to the corner. These uh, included 400 manuscripts, 400 of them, or 100 of them, biblical texts. Here's my good friend, Randall Price. He's uh, inspecting, there's the crack in the floor that they found a lot of them underneath. 1954, John Rockefeller agrees to uh, fund scroll research in Jerusalem for six years. And uh, it, it gets going. The problem they made is they just they start they divided stuff up to a lot of scholars, a lot of them good and some of them not so good, and so it went on for years, decades after decades, and they were just hanging on to this stuff, kind of you know if I have it and you don't you know I can kind of say well it looks like it says this or that, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. January 1956, Bedouin announced discovery of Cave 11, Kondo back in Bethlehem, by scrolls, including the Temple Scroll, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Two institutions in Jerusalem were formative in the task of deciphering them. The Ecole Biblique from France, great, uh, great center there, Rockefeller Museum uh, just outside the old city, Jerusalem. Both locations. Yeah, that's okay. Here we go. Can you guys back there read that on the right? Dead Sea Scrolls. What's it say? Later in the history of this thing, those things were bought for $250,000 each. And you literally had people behind the scenes trying to get it through universities and schools, getting it first. And uh, unbelievable, but actually on sale worldwide. Yigal Yadin, he's the second Babe Ruth of biblical archeology, span uh, the son of the first um, Babe Ruth. He uh, purchased the scrolls for, in Israel for 250,000. They are now exhibited in the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. So whenever you go on your trip, this is what one of the main sites you'll go to. It's shaped like those uh, tops from the jars. That's the symbolism. And uh, you'll see a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls there, things that they have found, etc., etc. Here we can just kind of flash through, give you different caves where scrolls were found. Let's take it forward there, pretty good. A lot of restatement. Yeah, December 1992, Dory of the Israeli Antiquities uh, Authority launches Operation Scroll. And it was the scholars versus the Bedouins, and guess who won? The Bedouins. They could really find the stuff. Next, Recovering Temple Scroll. Famous Temple Scroll, the largest of all of them, 26 feet for that size. Let's leave it right there. We will change over to a new presentation. Have our uh, break time. Be back in about 10 minutes, something like that.
Cei mai mulți dintre noi am uitat cum e la școală. Am auzit că câțiva în spatele nostru răsuflă în greu. Ăștia încă la școală, dar nu le plac școala. Haideți să învățăm împreună o cântare. Am învățat-o și noi ultimele săptămâni. Pe cruce mai răscumpărat. Pe cruce mai răscumpărat. Sper să nu mai plece mulți, unii s-au și pregătit de plecare. Haideți să cântăm împreună. Tot ce am e altă 
să-i mântui Să mântui prin crucea ta Să mântui prin crucea ta Să mântui prin crucea ta See Moses. We need our uh, Ketef. A discovery has been made um, a few years ago that has greatly altered the uh, accuracy of Scripture in the minds of those who are critics. If you take a look at Jerusalem. You have the Kidron Valley on the east between the city of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. You have on the south and halfway up the west side the Hinnom Valley. And uh, the Hinnom Valley was uh, not popular for two big reasons in history. Number one, it was the garbage dump. They come out the Dung Gate, South Gate, go down there, and it was always a smoldering, horrible stench. 24-7, but it's also where, at the time of Jeremiah, the Israelites had copied the Canaanites and were sacrificing babies in the fires. So when you just hear that, now this is, this is the Ben Hinnom, the equivalent of that in Greek is what? Ben Hinnom? What's the, play, what's the description Jesus gives when they ask him what hell is going to be like? Not Hades. Close. Gehenna. Yep. G-E, Valley, Hinnom. Gehenna. So Jesus' response was, you want to know what hell's like? Go down there and spend uh, 10 years in the pit with all the st stench and all that. Uh, that's what it's like. Oh, Gehenna. Gehenna is the Greek form of Valley of Hinnom in the Old Testament. So anyways, they uh, make this discovery across the Hinnom Valley, up a slope, and it has literally changed biblical studies uh, in the last number of years. What was found? That's what was found. That's one of them, inside and out. The longest one is about like this. And it's made out of pure silver. And uh, it has writing on the outside that is the oldest biblical Hebrew writing of a passage in history. 500 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is, out of, this is the first time we've always had to say, well, this is within 150 years or 500 years of the biblical time period. This is the first time when you can stand up and say that um, biblical writings have been found during the biblical time period. Scrolls have been found during the biblical time period and uh, guess what? It's one for one with the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's one for one with what was the, the Masoretic text back there at uh, 1100 AD, et cetera, et cetera. So, and it's also being used in a funeral situation. And so it's like even, even in the society got to the point where, oh yeah, in a burial, we put this on a necklace around the deceased person's neck and uh, that represent something very important for them and that family. So this is what they found. It took them a long time to unfold it because it was all smushed together and uh, goes back to 600 AD, or no, 600 BC. 
Where was it found? You can see there the, the box, the rectangle on the upper right, that is the Temple Mount. Then you see the old city coming on three sides of it. You see Mount Zion there at the bottom. That's the old Jebusite city that David made his capital. And uh, then you see the, the Hinnom Valley across the bottom. It even says that, Hinnom Valley at the bottom, and it goes up the left side halfway. Can you see the arrow? Lower left. That's pointing out where the caves were. So what happened? You had um, some buildings that were built World War I by the British. So they're occupying some ground. One of them gets destroyed, and it's a slope. So Ketef and Om, Ketef in Hebrew means a, a shoulder or a slope. Here, a slope of the side of the Hinnom Valley. But what they could tell was about eight feet, nine feet down is these have never been robbed. These have never been robbed. The, these things, the day they sealed the door, that was it. Never been robbed. What did they find in it? They found the amulets. They found a coin, time period of the Persian rule. That narrows things down. Everything they found by way of pottery, etc., etc., fits into the time period of the 600 BC. Absolutely off the chart, tiny. Now, the first time I saw them in Israel, everybody's talking about it. And I see another, another teacher, and he says, yeah, you better get over there. It's, it's first class. So I take my group over there, and it's the first time I've gone to an archaeological museum where you have four Israeli soldiers with submachine guns sitting around, standing around it. That kind of takes you back a little bit. Why? Oldest in the world. What price could you put on something like this? It's the oldest occurrence of the name Yahweh. It's the oldest occurrence of a biblical passage, Numbers chapter 6, and uh, the ironic blessing. It um, totally agrees with what we saw with the Dead Sea Scroll discovery and what was, how it was written and what it said. Virtual agreement right across the board. Here's a good friend. He's now much older than that. This is Gabriel um, Barquet. And he's one of the five leading archaeologists in Israel. And he was the one that really took this on and carried it through. That's when he was a little bit older. So what do you find? You dig out, you get all the gravel off, the weeds, the dirt, everything. And there, sure enough, is a tomb, family tomb, that has many different chambers for the burial process. Um, there are about 20 steps of burial. Of, for a Jewish person in the time of Jesus. And what they do is, you know, they get out the, they get out the word to the extended family. Great grandpa died. Everybody knows where to go, your family tomb. You don't say, well, you know, is this cemetery or that cemetery. You know exactly where to go. You've been there before. You go there and the older ones go in and there's a slab that you see like, like the ones laying at the top. There's a slab where they would um, put spice First off, wash the body, put spice on the body, and they do a layer of spice, and then wrapping, a layer, another layer of spice, and wrapping. It was not unusual for one's normal burial to use 70 pounds of spice for one burial. Why 70 pounds of spice? Decomposition, to offset the decomposition, and you may have two or three uh, relatives in there or a friend of the family that didn't have money to have a grave, things like that. But uh, sure enough, the spicing process, this is where the women in the Gospels have to go home. They can't be touching bodies and in a tomb uh, before, sun, before sundown. And so they hurry up as far as they can and they go back into the city. The women come out on Easter morning, what are they doing? What do they bring with them? 
more spice. The text says more spice. They were apparently somewhere into that process and had to get out of there. And so they were going back to finish that process. You would put, uh, some would put coins over the eyeballs, keep the, the eyes down or the lids down. Uh, all kinds of different things when it came from what was important in this person's life. If the person was like a uh, built homes, like a mason, there may be some of his favorite tools in there with him, that type of deal. So you go there, and then you slip the body in the, into the first room, lay it on that bench, and there it's there for a year, year and a half to decompose down to just the bone. And uh, from that point, you start to say, hey, it's just about over, but it's a year, year and a half that's elapsed to that point. A lot different than today, right? Where sometimes people can't you know, get, the, get the jets and everything right to be there, and so you have a third of the family there and a third wishing they could be there, that type of situation. Do you find stuff? Oh, you find stuff every hour. It's unbelievable. So they would all be in decomposition mode. Yeah, we can pass this. Who found them and when? A evangelical girl from Wheaton College, Judy Hadley, a volunteer who didn't want to go to work that day. She went to work and she discovered two historical mega items. The second was found during the sifting process. You see when you scrape across, you still got clumps of soil. And so you put it into buckets and you go over to the three sifters and you start sifting. Why? Because a lot of times there's good stuff in the clumps. There you often find a lot of coins, things like that, beads, etc., etc. Taking a closer look, the first amulet. Now this is a little bit smaller than a chapstick item. Catefinome amulet two. Notice the size or the lack of size. But here, when you examine more closely, you say, wait a minute, there's some writing on here, ancient writing, ancient biblical writing. So you go through, sure enough, it starts to add up, letter by letter, whatever. At some point, they could determine definitely it is a passage from the book of Numbers. And then they kind of work from there. What is that? The Z, what looks like a Z on the upper right and a little dash in the back, that's a Yod. Smallest Hebrew letter, Yod, like a uh, Y. Then you have two letters the same, right? The second and the fourth. Those are a He. And then you have a Vav, which is a uh, third one in from the right. That's the earliest representation in history uh, anywhere of Yahweh. Oldest one, and then you can take it because we don't use that style Hebrew today in biblical studies. Uh, we use the old, um, what's called the Ara Aramaic font. This is ancient Hebrew. That's what ancient Hebrew looks like, and that is the first ever discovery. On your own, you can uh, take a picture of that. That's all the different variations of Hebrew over about 500 years. And all you had to do is go across and match, and sure enough, it fit the right category. <clears throat> Alabaster vessels they found, silver, arrowheads, bone, ivory, beads, a uh, piece of pre-blown glass, and a rare coin. The coin is big. If you open up a, what, a historical marker at some building, I'd imagine there's probably going to be a, some coins in there or paper money or whatever. But that dates the place, right? I mean, whoever put this together, it was at least by that date that the person could put stuff in here. How were the amulets dated? Uh, how, were they, how were they dated? Paleography, the style of the writing. Just think of a handwriting, uh, but a font. So if you went to scribal school, whoever that scribe was, they have sold you on this is the font 
we should do, or this is the only one our group uses. What's the significance of the amulets? Comparison with other Old Testament manuscripts. Masoretic text dates basically up to 900, 1,000. Dead Sea Scrolls, we gave you the dates on there. Ketephanom, guess what? Jeremiah the prophet is walking around Jerusalem and ministering when this funeral is going on. This is the first time we can say for fact, here is a text of scripture that goes right back to biblical time periods. This is big because there was always, well, you know, show me something, show me something, show me something. Well, yeah, come on along, we'll show you something. Take a look at this. Some sources. We can click off there. Um, we need um, the um, autopsy um, of the crucified man. This is not real. This is important. It's a one-for-one one rep replica of what is being found now. We, we said at some point that scholars kept saying that Romans didn't use crucifixion during the time of Jesus or time of the New Testament. And you can go on your own, just do a search, you'll find Commentary after commentary after commentary after commentary. The Bible's wrong. The writer of this uh, this passage is wrong because they never did that. Well, you're going to see you're going to see something phenomenal. I mean, they didn't even read Josephus. Josephus talks about crucifixion by the Romans all over the place. How do you not go to a paper like that and, and take a look at Josephus, whether you agree with him or not? Uh, anyways. <clears throat> the, uh, the discovery, we can give you a little overview. It's 1968. It's in Jerusalem. It's north of the old city. Basically in a little residential area, and, and some guy wants to build a gas station. So he gets all the permits. He starts to dig. And if you're, if you're going to build something in Jerusalem, you be ready for some woe and suffering. Because if they find anything of anything archaeologically, your project is closed down until the archaeologists come and do their work and say they can keep building. Or if it's something real important, they may say, we're going to give you a different location. This is so important, we're not letting the gas station be on top of it, and so on. So anyways, they're digging to lay out this foundation for the gas station. And sure enough, they start finding stuff and more. And more, and more to the point where, oh no, we got to call the antiquities department. Out comes the antiquities department. And they said, you got to put your project off a while, at least a year, maybe two, and we need a full excavation here. Okay, so they start a full excavation. And they start finding these, these boxes, either made out of limestone or wood, they're about this long, about this high, that wide and they're called ossuaries. Ossuary basically is a burial box for the bones, not the flesh, the bones. So it, it would have to be at how long? How long is the femur? You'd have to be able to either cross right or long ways to get the femur in there, right? So most of you find that they're literally about this, like this, they can either have the lid uh, or sometimes just one end carved out, etc., etc. But it's definitely a cemetery. They're finding all the kinds of things you would find in a, in a uh, family uh, burial cave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, they get digging, and guess what? They open up one of the ossuary boxes, and what do they find? Now, I had a guy teach me Shakespeare in 12th grade. In the middle of Shakespeare, it had nothing to do with the lecture or what we were doing. He says, Eh, you can't crucify anybody. I, the Bible's, I don't know what the Bible is, but it's off. I said, well, I can't crucify anybody. 
says, well, the flat, you know, ought to be too heavy, and uh, it would pull through the the uh, heads of the nails, and the body fall off. I didn't, didn't know what to say. I had never heard that before as a kid. But years later, you know, we start digging into these areas, and here you find out <coughs> what you're going to see is the real one. This is we'll send this around. The Romans were smart. What did they have between the head of the spike and the bone? A wooden washer. Thick wooden washer. What do you use a washer for? To strengthen what? So here's what you have. In it. And then he said, well, you know, it just fall off, right? All the way, boom. That's what the Romans did. They would blunt the nail. So here you have the wooden uh, washer. You have a blunted nail. And so they got all the way through and they blunted it. Let's see. We need this man right here. Let's see. Carrot, let's see. So, today you can go to a section of the Hebrew Museum in Jerusalem. They have now what they never had before, a whole section on early Christianity. When I first went to Israel in 73, people would whisper the name Jesus. They didn't want people around them hearing the name Jesus. The last time the word Jesus is used in written documents basically comes from about 126 AD. There's, uh, I attended a lecture by a scholar from Hebrew University over at a synagogue in Detroit area, and he's reading this Baba Bathra text, a lady that had a husband, he died, another husband, he died. And he's reading along and he says, Jesus been Jesus. And the room gets really quiet. And he looks up and he says, I see you find it a little bit strange that the, word, the name Jesus is being used around 126 um, AD. He says, no. It was. He says, after about 130, for whatever reason, you started seeing less and less of it for a Christian, for a Christian name. But he says, um, it's, it's used pretty solid from the time of the Gospels uh, backwards and uh, till about 126 AD. So we come along here and um, is, is there evidence that the Romans used crucifixion in the first century AD? So what does Josephus say? Josephus mentions crucifixion many, many times, same term used as in the New Testament. And uh, he says at one point the Romans got so mad at the Jews that they crucified 400 men on top of the wall. 400 men were dying on top of the wall around Jerusalem. Who was doing it? The Romans. Read through Josephus. It's, you can get it free online. Read through Josephus. Just do a search study. And it's like, whoa. You didn't quote one of the uh, great historians of that time on this topic? I mean, to me, that's a, that's a given. You may not agree with him, but, I mean, what, what is the scholar saying about that? Archaeology. We need more people volunteering. We can get you on a, a site that's not at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Uh, if you are interested, Moses has my uh, email and number. 
Uh, also, he asked me if I'd spend just a minute on the uh, seminary. If you have a uh, college degree, our programs are uh, MAs at level and also an MDiv, which is a 90-hour degree. If you um, are going to different types of ministry, the MDiv is kind of the flagship degree worldwide for uh, Bible pastors, teachers, missionaries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, scholars, and um, you can, of course, that can prepare you to go into the military chaplaincy. We have 11 chaplains now. Our grads who are in Iraq and Iran. One of our grads wrote back his first assignment. He was supposed to be with this large group of soldiers, but under two senior chaplains. He finally got there, they're gone. He now, for three weeks, is ministering to 7,000 troops. He says it went from early morning to night. You name the problem, the problem came down the line. He said it was the closest thing he ever thought of when it talks about Jesus ministering to literally thousands. <laughs> he said it was endless. As far as you could see, people, you know, whether it was death itself, whether it was uh, um, shock from you know, being around bombs, uh, whether it was from seeing horrible things, I mean, on and on and on. And um, sure enough, the... Um, the uh, archaeological method uh, helps by way of building up our Old Testament survey classes, our New Testament survey classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you may say, oh, I'm not too sure what God wants me to do in the coming years. I would say, come on over some night, sit in some classes, talk to some students, see what goes on, the level of discussion, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, God may have a ministry for you in some type of full-time or part-time ministry. Um, great things are going on out there, folks, and uh, we always hear all the negative stuff. This was interesting. The country of Nigeria is half Christian, half Muslim. So the Muslims go to the government years ago and they say, uh, you know, in Islam we have uh, pilgrimage. We would uh, like the state to fund our pilgrimage. So the state started funding their pilgrimage, you know, plane after plane after plane. They actually bought a plane just to go back and forth with people doing their pilgrimage. And uh, so after a while, the Christians got together, the leaders, and they said, well, wait a minute. We want a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They okayed it. They got their own jet. And you'll know the, the Nigerian groups, phenomenal singers. I mean, just out there, beautiful. And um, they'll come in, the government pays their round flight, pays their hotels, pays their food, and gives them, I think, 500 bucks to spend. And it's like unbelievable. It's like you never hear that. It's like all the bad stuff. Well, wait a minute, here you got tens of thousands of born-again believers uh, going to the land of the Bible and gaining a lot to be able to teach their classes, counsel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you may be looking at counseling programs. Uh, Dr. John Restum uh, at the seminary, he uh, was the head counselor at the Wayne County Jail for the longest time. And uh, his wife has, from the same institution, the same two degrees as Moses' um, wife. Unbelievable. But a lot is going on today. Perhaps you, uh, on an undergrad level, you are into uh, counseling psychology. I would come on over and talk to our uh, instructors. Uh, our, one of our other instructors has uh, had a family practice for 35 years, has dealt a lot with uh, junior high, high school uh, kids, uh, young adults. And uh, Dr. Restum, uh, you'll hear stories you can't believe because he's, he's been in the, he says if it's bloody and gory on television at 11 o'clock at night, he has to interview him. And uh, so that brings a whole lot of unusual reality uh, to the situation. Questions you have, then we'll be done. Any questions?
No questions. Good being with you. Lord, blessing upon you. And come on over and take a visit at uh, the seminary in Plymouth. God bless you. Thank you. Aș vrea să vă rog să ne ridicăm. Mulțumim, profesor Mehiu. A fost cel puțin interesant și important să mă uit, să văd, să înțeleg și încă o dată să mă ancorez credința în Dumnezeu. Pentru cei care ați priceput cu adevărat importanța acestei seri, ați putut să vedeți că și știința dovedește că există Dumnezeu și că Biblia este o carte păstrată într-un mod deosebit, cuvânt al lui Dumnezeu, prezervat de-a lungul generațiilor cu acuratețe. Ceea ce aveți în mâinile dumneavoastră, în casele dumneavoastră, este cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Apostolul Pavel spunea lui Timotei în 1 Timotei, capitolul 6, Timotei, păzește ce ți s-a încredințat. Ferește-te de flăcăriile lumești și de împotrivirile științei pe nedrept numite astfel. A fost frumos să vedem cum ceea ce avem în mână este cu bătaie lungă. Pentru cine vrea să creadă, argumente sunt destule. Pentru cine vrea să nu creadă, rămâne necredința lui. Aș vrea să stăm în seara asta și să ne rugăm. Probabil pentru cei mai în vârstă, lucrurile astea au fost, o sună poate prea la un alt nivel, un nivel academic. Dar pentru tinerii care au fost aici și și-au notat, cu siguranță lucrurile astea au stănit în ei pasiune și cel puțin un fundament să meargă să cerceteze și să vadă că ceea ce avem noi în Scriptură este Cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Aș vrea să ne rugăm și să cerem binecuvântarea lui Dumnezeu pentru copiii noștri. Trăiesc într-o lume în care ceea ce ați auzit, oamenii pun la îndoială dacă Biblia este Cuvântul lui Dumnezeu. Dați-mi dovezi, asta vrea lumea, dați-mi dovezi științifice. Arătați-mi, argumentați-mi, cum, de și așa mai departe. Aș vrea să ne rugăm ca Dumnezeu să binecuteze credința în inima lor și a noastră deopotrivă. Să rămânem credincioși lui Dumnezeu. Ne rugăm și mulțumim Domnului. Aș vrea să-ți mulțumesc pentru binecuvântele pe care le-ai revărsat pentru noi astăzi. În lumina cuvintelor ascultate, aș vrea să te rog să binecuvintezi toți copiii tăi oriunde s-ar afla. Noi lucrăm aici în biserică, sunt alții care lucrează, iată, în afară și căutăm, Doamne, fiecare din noi să arătăm lumii că există un Dumnezeu real, viu, Doamne Dumnezeule, te rog să binecuvintezi creștinii care sunt într-un nivel academic 
și care caută prin aceste dovezi să argumenteze în măsura în care pot. Eu te rog frumos să ne binecuvintesc credința noastră ancorată în Biblie și chiar și atunci când știință este în neștiință, te rog să binecuvintesc credința noastră, pentru că nu este știință mai înaltă decât să te cunoască pe tine omul și să creadă în tine. Binecuvântă Biserica Grace, binecuvântă copiii tinerii bisericii noastre, să rămână credincioși și ancorați în cuvântul Tău. Doamne, îți mulțumesc că astăzi am fost împreună. Rămâne, Doamne, Psalmul 117 ca un îndemn pentru săptămâna în care umblăm. Ascultă lauda bisericii tale, primește lauda bisericii tale, ne vom baza, Doamne, pe bunătatea Ta, pe credincioșia Ta și vom merge în această săptămână și vom fi purtători de lumină, de har, de binecuvântare. Îți mulțumesc, Doamne, pentru profesorul Mehiu, te rog să-l binecuvintesc cu sănătate, cu putere, Doamne, și acolo la nivelul academic unde este pus de Tine, Doamne, să fie folosit de Duhul Tău în prelucrarea viitorilor lucrători. Te rog să binecuvintesc Biserica Grace și încă o dată te rog, Doamne, pe cei care astăzi sunt în suferință, fi Tu sprijinul lor, fi Tu mângâierea lor, fi Tu puterea lor de a depăși orice situație. În fața Ta, Doamne, ne smerim, în fața Ta ne proșternem și în numele Tău îl binecuvântăm. Amin. Vă mulțumim tuturor pentru că ați ales în această seară să fiți cu noi. Vă dorim tuturor o săptămână binecuvântată. Nu uitați slujbele Bisericii Grace, joi, la ora 7, la rugăciune și duminica viitoare, cu ajutorul Domnului din nou, la ora 10, la părtășie. Har, pace tuturor!